I guess before we take our Bibles and turn over to Mark, why don't we bow for a word of prayer and ask the Spirit, the Word who inscripturated His revelation to tutor us in His truth. Father, thank You for the privilege to hold a copy of the Word of God in our own tongue, to have a place that You have provided for us to come away from the craziness of life in this fallen world, to worship You, to learn the Word of God. Thank You for the the gifts You have given us to serve You and the gifted ones You've given to Your church. Thank You, Lord, for what's been poured into our lives. We give You much praise, asking that You would help us as we sit at the feet of our Savior to focus our eyes, our hearts, our attention on His instruction. Would You be so kind to convict us of sin and exhort us towards righteousness? Uh, change us through Your inspired and inerrant Word, which is living and active, that gets down into the heart and produces life change at a heart level. Thank You for that. We beg You, O oh God, make us more diligent followers of Yours, having been together through the Word. We pray in Christ's name. For his sake. Amen. If you take your Bibles and turn over to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Verses 28 to 34 is our text today, providentially there. We just take the next set of verses. I'd like to preach to a sermon that I didn't take much brains for a sermon titled The Greatest Commandment, because that's exactly the question Jesus was asked. Out of all the hundreds and hundreds of commands God has given, what's the most important? Now, I'm sure there aren't too many of you, dear friends in Christ, like your pastor, who on the rare occasion when I have pulled up to a drive through menu, rolls down the back window of, well, it used to be the Suburban, but uh, the kids quite often sit in the back seat of the truck and roll down the back window for even one of the kids to order rather than dear old dad. Or like the other day when we pulled through a coffee kiosk and my beloved bride ordered all the various drinks because when I come to any place, whether it's a coffee kiosk, fast food place, new diner with this big expansive menu, it is information overload. There is so much there, I don't see a bit of it. There's such a multitude of choices. There's so much information my brain overloads, and since we understand that I've only got a couple of brain cells anyways. As you look at the Word of God that consists of 66 individual books contributing to the same storyline, consistent authors writing with each other, did you ever get the sense when you were a new believer that there's so much in there, there's a lot of pages, this is a big book, so many commands that you kind of wish for the cliff note version that, that boil it all down. Now, I know that you younger people here uh, don't know what cliff notes are. I don't think they make them anymore because so many people aren't even reading anymore. And uh, they just kind of boil it all down so I don't have to do all the hard work of digging through. Just think of uh, one set of commands all throughout the New Testament. We've referred to the, the one another commands. When you come to a one another phrase in the New Testament, this is what body life, healthy body life in the local church looks like, where we're commanded, prefer one another, be devoted to one another, be of the same mind to one another, don't judge one another, build up one another, don't envy one another, care for one another, admonish one another. You want me to go through all 40? I, I don't need to do that, but I, I point to that for illustrative purposes. Jesus boils everything down. When popped the question to him about what is the most important commandment, he boils it all down to the love principle. Fulfilling the law in love. The biblical theology of love, that concept, is the foundation of the Christian life. It is the, definition, uh, the defining characteristic identifying a true believer. What is a Christian? One way you could define a Christian is these are those 
who love the one true and living God. True spiritual and eternal life begins with loving God. Though we imperfectly do so in this life, it's going to culminate in loving Him perfectly in heaven. So as we come with all of our distractions to worship, wishing that we could worship God deeper and more consistently, there is coming that day, dear saint, when we can do it perfectly without the hindrance of this uh, sinful flesh. But this is not just the standard for believers. Everlasting punishment in hell awaits those who refuse to love God. So here we've got the third group of the Sanhedrin to test Jesus, who despised him for confronting their aberrant theology. Jesus came and he wrecked their religious system. And having such sway and popularity with the people, they were jealous. All these followers of Jesus. Our text comes right on the heels of nonstop challenges and debate in the temple. And yet, for the first time since arriving in Jerusalem, Jesus is approached not by a group, but by one individual. This individual came, and he heard, and he saw. Beloved, I want you to learn to think and work through Jesus' interpretive love grid. It's an exposition that, uh, that I'm giving to you that is not original with me. It's Jesus' exposition of how we ought to think about every detail of life. It goes through this filter, the love filter. It's for everyone in all of life, for our thoughts and desires, our words and behavior, to please him by loving him above all else as he demands and deserves and loving neighbor over self. Set your eyes on Mark 12, 28, if you would. We're told that one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he, speaking of Jesus, had answered them well, asked Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. We're faced in verse number 28 with an inquiring scribe. By the way, the, the uh, outlines on the back of your bulletin as usual. We've got an inquiring scribe. You could also call him an irenic scribe. I've been known in weekly emails when teaching an online class to mention to my students on their discussion boards, because that's one big feature of online education where you have to post a, a discussion to a discussion board, and then later on in the week you have to interact with your fellow students on their post. And though you're supposed to uh, speak the truth, Paul says, but you speak it in what? Love. Be irenic. Though you're supposed to evaluate each other, how about a little Christian charity as you evaluate rather than castigate this person for an aberrant being in, in, in horrible heresy or something? This is a story in Mark where a scribe approaches Jesus on amicable terms. He's not like the others that have come up to Jesus on the same day in the temple. When the groups came and asked Jesus questions, these were not questions that they were looking for answers for. They were set in a trap to try to trap Jesus with his words and decimate his reputation before the people. So we're faced with a little, little dilemma. Because what Mark presents as 
a, a single scribe coming on friendly terms where he is in turn commended by Jesus. This is a lesson, not a controversy like the previous text that we've looked at. But how do we harmonize this with Matthew? Because Matthew says that he asked the question tempting him. Is Matthew contradicting Mark? Not at all. Again, we've got to understand authorial intent. Mark, Matthew has a different purpose than Mark. He's bringing out different features. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are given different details from each other that are important to them. Matthew was looking at the whole group. If you were to look at Matthew's account, he mentions the whole group of the Pharisees of which this one scribe was part of. But Mark was focused on the individual. He doesn't mention this guy's personal motive. Actually, his motive is going to come out very clearly in the next few verses. Let me give you a footnote here. Since I bring up Matthew to help us interpret Mark, I know that many of you tote our beloved MacArthur Study Bible with you. And if you are uh, bring that to church and are utilizing that, notice how that in that particular study Bible, before each new pericope, each new paragraph, each new thought, they're harmonizing the Gospels. And so this section of Mark will tell us where Matthew talks about this same event. And it's only Matthew and Mark that talk about this event. Luke does not record it. So Mark records one of the scribes came. Matthew identifies him as a lawyer. Not like the kind of attorneys that we experience in our day. These are uh, kind of secretary of state experts in the law, the scholars of Mosaic law. These grammatus were clerks. And many, if not most, of the scribes, the professional students and teachers of the Scriptures, belong to one another of the Pharisaical schools. Not every scribe was a scribe of the Pharisees, but most of them were. And there's a lot of Pharisees. As Jesus not only answered the Sadducees' question last week and schooled them on their wrong understanding of the resurrection, I think I'd mentioned in the exposition that there's there weren't a lot of Sadducees. There were a whole lot of Pharisees. There, uh, Josephus, early his, Jewish historian, figured there's about 6,000 of them. And so this scribe was a scribe of the Pharisees. And again, he, he seems open-minded. He heard the, the arguing that had just gone on between Jesus and the Sadducees. And he noticed that Jesus gave an admirable reply. He's just caught off guard. Because the narrative he had heard about this rabbi was not true. And he's amazed that Jesus was teaching in such a clear and authoritative way. So he's got a, um, there's no obvious trickery here. Even though the various groups use their questions to set a trap, here we've got one humble, sincere inquirer, different between, uh, or I think there's a difference between when somebody is challenging to cause conflict and a sincere approach in asking a question. We, we encourage questions around here at Grace Bible Church. We're not scared of questions. We just open up our Bible and seek to derive a biblical answer. There's a big difference between this ironic scribe who has a sincere question and the religious hypocrites that Jesus has already corrected who were more interested in challenging and causing conflict. So notice the, the friendly question that he poses to Jesus. What commandment is foremost? The term is kratos. What's first place or most important? Out of all the commands, what ranks in the highest place? There's any number of commands that we not only break, beloved, but we don't fill full. And so if every day of our lives and every week until Jesus comes again or calls us home and glorifies our bodies, if we're going to miss a lot, what's the most important? Because we can't get that one wrong. 
while holding all commands as binding, the Jewish rabbis would attempt to formulate a basic principle from which the rest of the law could be deduced. What's a clear paradigm to follow? If there's hundreds of commands, give us a step-by-step, -step, would you? For instance, the, probably the, one of the most familiar examples would be Rabbi Hillel, 60 BC to AD 20, who gave a negative version of the golden rule. He said, what is hateful to thyself, do not to thy neighbor. This is the whole law, the rest is commentary. So the rabbis were already accustomed to discussing what commandments were heavy commandments and which were the light commandments. Because again, if we're going to mess it all up, let's mess up the light ones, not the heavy ones. As if the light ones aren't important. And I, I have my own soapbox I'm trying not to step up on. When we talk about secondary doctrines and put something in that column, what have we just done? We've said it kind of, we've allocated it as not quite as important. If it's doctrine, if it's Bible, it's important. In the Mishnah and the Talmud, they preserved a number of answers from famous, famous rabbis. In rabbinic tradition, they counted out 613 different commandments. 365 of those commandments are negative prohibitions. Don't do this. And then 248 positive ones do this. Now, 613, that's a lot to try to remember. A century after Jesus, A.D. 135, Rabbi Ichaba reduced the Torah to Leviticus 19.18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I'm sorry, sir. You came one century too late to get Jesus' lesson. You should know that that is important, but not the most foremost important. So Jesus says this ironic and friendly scribe, what's your take? Point two, verses 29 to 31, a summarizing of the law. Jesus, without even missing a beat, answers. Verse 29, the foremost is hero Israel. And I probably shouldn't put my hand up to my ear because in the Hebrew, there's not a, the term for obey. So to hear means to obey. You cannot know without doing. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Say verse 31 in your mind for just a moment. Jesus' immediate answer is the Shema. Hebrew term Shema means to hear. Not just hear, but obey. That is the answer of primary importance. And though it was missed, it pictured with their own religious practices. Now, to help you non-Hebrew people, non-Jewish, us Gentiles understand what went on religiously, the Shema consisted of Numbers 15, verses 37 to 41, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 to 9, and chapter 11, verses 13 to 21. And the pious Jew recited every morning and every night the Shema. He repeated that in his worship, both morning and night, as a religious creed or a confession of faith. Now, Grace Bible Church has our own statement of faith of what, where we boil down what we think that the Bible teaches. These are important doctrines for us to understand. They kind of define us as a church as doctrines that we hold dear. Theology is important. This was their, the Jewish confession of faith. Unfortunately, it's something that had become empty ritual. But it proclaimed Jehovah's basic demand upon Israel as his chosen people. So Jesus quoted the first part, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. But before we remember what he quoted right here in, in, in Mark, you know, I'm going back to Deuteronomy 5, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, I always 
I, I, I can't find my passage when I'm talking. It's, it's a horrible issue. Deuteronomy, where am I going? Five. So the theme of Deuteronomy is expressed in Deuteronomy 5, verses 32 and 33, where Moses shares with Israel, you shall observe to do just as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right or to the left. You shall walk in the way which the Lord your God has commanded you that you may live and that it may be well with you and that you may prolong your days in the land which you will possess. What's the significance of Deuteronomy? Where, where is Moses chattering to God's people? They're about to go into the land God had already promised years before, and it's a reminder. Deuteronomy is a, a reiteration of the law. Here are the covenant requirements. Obey God, he'll bless your socks off. Oh, I guess you don't have socks. Sandals off. And uh, uh, disobey him, you'll experience the covenant curses. Mosaic law was something that it was a two-way street. God obligated himself to take care of his people. That doesn't mean they could act any, any way they want. So in... In Deuteronomy 5, verses 32 and 33, on the precipice of the Jordan River before they go into the promised land, there's the reminder, the whole theme of Deuteronomy expressed. And building on that theme, Moses begins what is in our English Bible, the next chapter. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 1, this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Why'd they need a reminder? Like the old hymn says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. They'd been previously told, do not intermarry. They're going to intermarry. And those wives are going to draw their heart away from the Lord. Ask Solomon what it was like. Or any other Old Testament saint. So he reiterated that his purpose was to teach the people obedience to God as they entered the promised land. Don't forget, you're going to experience the good of the land, the fruit. And with the fruit of the land, you're going to soon forget who got you there by a strong and mighty hand. And you're going to think it's by your own labors. Uh uh Then he gives the motive for their obedience, that it's a heart overflowing with love and gratitude. Notice in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words which I am commanded you today shall be on your heart. That's the motive. It was the standard by which Josiah, the greatest reformer king in Israel's history was judged. If you wanted to jot down for tea time this afternoon, 2 Kings 23. In 2 Kings 23, verses 4 and following recounts the reforms under King Josiah. He was a marvelous, godly man that God used in a, an astounding way. So God's people by this point had virtually gone apostate and he's calling them to repentance. He reforms. There's a great revival. You know, he's been breaking in pieces the sacred pillars, cut down the ashram and filled their places with human bones. Verse 15, furthermore, the altar that was at Bethel and the high place which Jer Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, who made Israel sin, had made even that altar and the high place he broke down. He didn't spare anything that dishonored God. And then he demolished its stones, ground them to dust, and burned the Asherah.
Passover is reinstated as required in the law. Verse 24, he's removed the mediums, the spiritists, the teraphim, the idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might confirm the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Even the law of God got lost. Before him, there was no king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. Dear friends, where's the Josiahs of our day? Those who are, are not on again, off again, Half hot, half cold. How long are we going to halter between our opinion? If God is God, let's serve Him. So going back to our text of Mark 12, verse 29, this affirmation is not in Matthew. This is only included in Mark where Mark wants them to be reminded that Israel was known as the one Yahweh people, the one true God, all these pagan nations around them, polytheism, many gods. Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. Mark targeted Roman believers, particularly the Gentiles. And boy, the Roman people were a polytheistic people. In Old Testament, Israel was set apart in religion of affirming monotheism in the midst of all the land espousing polytheism. So the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You know, in our study on Wednesdays when we get to the Trinity, you look at various individual verses of the Scriptures that talk about the Father's God and Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit's God. And if you don't fill in all your theology, you might think you got three gods. The Trinity is three in one. You think about that too long, it blows the circuit breakers of your mind. The Lord, our God, stresses Israel's distinctive relationship to Him. They were not a people. God made a people for His glory to worship Him and Him alone. This Lord is acclaimed as one, stressing His unity. God is the one and only Lord not only of Israel, but of every individual as well. He lays rightful claim to every facet of human personality, man's heart, man's soul, his mind, his strength, bought and paid for, because he's the one that created us and created us for his glory. Now, four times in the next verse, verse 30, the word all is repeated, emphasizing the necessity of total response of love to God's lordship. No shrinking back, no halfway, no partiality. Notice again verse 30, when he says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. The obligation arose from the fact that he is one in comparison with the gods, little g gods, of the heathen that are idols. He'd chosen Israel in covenant love to not practice idolatry. Their constant duty, love him supremely with a love of intelligence and purpose so that it's, it's a moral obligation. It's not a ceremonial one. Don't just... Bring your gift to the altar. Don't just do your sacrificial system and leave your heart at home. doesn't work that way. It's not a beautiful aroma in God's nostrils if it is disconnected from a heart of worship and adoration. There were a lot of them. How do we end the Old Testament in Malachi? They're bringing the halt and the lame, the second best, indicating their divided allegiance in their heart. Constant duty. Their love was to be a response to his love. When you see covenant in the Old Testament, you better think relationship. You'll be able to interpret those covenants. It's a loving obligation. It's a delightful duty. 
You know, before considering each part of the verse, notice that the word from, X in Greek, precedes each. It is from this source, not the means of it. It's not simply with the whole heart, but from it. Not the instrument of the heart, but the source. Now, what's Jesus already taught us about the heart in the Gospel of Mark? The uh, Jesus and his disciples in chapter 7 were eating with dirty hands. Maybe they weren't physically dirty, but they were ceremonially unclean. They didn't go through the process that every pious Jew would go through. And the religious crowd came and they castigated him and his disciples for their dirtiness. And Jesus schools them of where uncleanness comes from. Mark 7.21 The heart is viewed as the source out of which there are many issues of life. Every sin is not just outside of us. You can see a lot of people's sins. We can hear their sins. We can watch our sins. But every sin, even the ones that we can't see, they come from the heart. That's its source. That's the source of all evil. You see what's so, what's so wrong with many of the sacrifices in the Old Testament and leading into the New in the Gospels? Was it became empty ritual? Removed from the heart of devotion and love at the core of man's being. To grow cold in love or to lose one's love is no mi minor down note. It's everything. Ask the church at Ephesus. They were doctrinally correct and not only practiced orthodox theology, they corrected others' wrong theology. But they lost the wonder of it all. They lost their first love. Now both the Hebrew and Greek versions of the Shema in Deuteronomy describe a threefold response to God that ought to characterize us. There's a whole sermon we can't take. We can't have another sermon within the sermon. We'd be here till after fellowship dinner. Uh, there's a, a sermon from Deuteronomy 6, Loving God Supremely on Biblical Expositor. But notice the elements that he gives us here. The heart. Love comes from the heart. And your pastor wants to give you some shepherding comments because we just came off Valentine's Day on Monday. Where there were hearts everywhere. You go to the dollar store, everything's discounted now, right? All the Valentine's stuff. And the heart is pictured at the seat of romance and emotion. Cupid's everywhere. And man often defines love as emotional. Emotions are liars. Fickle feelings that we are created with. We are intellect, emotion, and will. We understand they're part of our being. Burke Parsons posted on social media this week, don't believe everything you feel. Our emotions are the greatest liars that we know. Preach the truth to your emotion, and the truth will begin to change or at least control your emotions by the power of the Spirit. We admit our emotions, but we're not driven by them because they many times are lying and going to lead us into sin. So, the heart's not the seat of emotion. In the, in the Hebrew, it was your bowels. Now, lest you think I'm getting grotesque here, they understood that emo emotions resided in the bowels. The Bible talks about, especially in the King James, bo having bowels of compassion. And for those of you who have been constipated know what an emotional experience it can be in the hebrew in the old testament the heart was not the seat of our emotions the heart matter of fact the the septuagint the greek translation of the old testament in hebrew in uh, deuteronomy 6 renders the Hebrew term lab, which is the term for heart, renders it in the Greek, not cardia, 
but renders it as mind. Heart and mind are a consistent theology in the Old Testament theology. Loving God with our mind. The heart was the seat of personality. It's the rational part of man, because emotions can be very irrational. His mind, his intellect, in the Old Testament, love for God, hear me carefully, is volitional before it's emotive. Love is a decision before it ever sheds a tear or writes those sappy romance cards to our spouse. Love is a decision. It's something to be done. It's something to be chosen. In biblical counseling, this is where we're seeking to see people change, not just outward behavior modification, you know, stop drinking and chewing and go, going with girls that do, you know. It's not just external, it is internal. It's driven in our heart. So going back to uh, let, let Jesus' Sermon on the Mount illustrate what we're, what we're trying to understand here. The religious hypocrites, the scribes and the Pharisees thought we're great. Look at us. We haven't committed murder. Yeah, but you're harboring a heart of anger. Yeah, but we haven't committed acts of adultery with another man's wife. But yes, you've got a lustful heart. Let's get to the heart of the issue because that's where the heart is mission control center according to Scripture. Mission control center. Man is directed by his heart and what controls it. Whether that heart is consumed with the glory of God or a continuing love for self. When the Bible talks about man's heart thinking and willing and our conscience and our affections, you see the, the sin that multiplied in Genesis 6. God looked at man who had sinned in Genesis 3 and he said that the thoughts and the intents of his heart was only evil continually. Man is strategizing in his heart wickedness. So obedience isn't incompatible with love. It's essential. It's volitional before it's emotional. Obedience flows out of our worship. Jesus said, remember when he said, why do you say you love me and don't do what I command you? If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. John 14, 15. So I, I know I'm a week late for Valentine's, but brothers, you want to be romantic and speak biblically of emoting? I know she's not going to like that little card that says that I love you, dear, from my bowels. But to get past the emotion of it all, I mean, we had a we had a we celebrated a, a wedding pretty recently when a husband and wife covenant together in the promise and the commitment of marriage that doesn't sound very romantic but it's the only thing that holds you together like glue in a Christ-centered home when you're waking up next to the dragon breath and the person that doesn't treat you quite like you think you ought to be treated and the, the, the bubble the dream of marriage of what you thought it was going to be it's a lot of hard work blood sweat and tears where we've committed to love them which biblically defined God so loved the world, he sat back and twiddled his thumbs with the lost people, right? No, God so loved his world that, uh, this world that he gave his son. It's active. Volitional. As it's thinking and saying to itself. So again, we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Love to God must possess the whole heart, the seat of personality, the whole soul, self-conscious life, and the whole mind, our rational faculties, our, our strength, your whole strength, the entire active powers of man. Now, let me be clear here. The Hebrew of Deuteronomy 6 is not might. The term is actually muchness. And I know that doesn't make good English, but it makes good biblical Hebrew. What does it mean to love God with our muchness? To be exceeding and abundant in that love. Everything we are and have. 
That's why that word, all of our might, our strength, everything you have until you are dog tired, spiritually speaking. Realize that these are not necessarily three different aspects of loving, but a love that's all inclusive, no holdouts, all of our essence and expression, dear friends. Great intensity, great fervor. It's not hypocritical, it's not half hearted, but it's affectionately, intelligently, energetically, and entirely given to God. The most, so back to the ironic scribe. Jesus, I just asked a simple question. Love God with everything you are and have. All of expression and desire. By the way, give you a, he gave him a two-for-one special. Notice how Jesus addresses our, the two planes of our experience. Because we're not just vertically related to God, but we are horizontally related to man. Verse 31, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. So here he's asked one command, he threw in another, teaching that they're inseparable. Though the first is the most important, it also cannot be divorced from that horizontal plane of experience in our humanity. The first, love for God, is what enables love for man. If we have never received the sacrificial love of Christ in our salvation, we're not going to love the way God has called us to love one another. They're inseparable. So he added this to kind of set forth the complete duty of love. They can't be divorced. You know, the, the vertical can't be divorced from the horizontal. He established that the Godward and the manward aspects of love are inseparable. How's this continue to work out in, in a, uh, a New Testament theology? Well, in 1 John chapter 4, Get there. First John chapter 4 and verse number 21. John the Apostle says, And this commandment we have from him. What, do you, what command do you suppose he's going to refer to? That the one who loves God should love his, neighbor, his brother also. Let's not think that we have done our duty, our delightful duty to God by loving him, we have everything we are and have, if we're not loving our brother. John gives us love tests to authenticate our birth certificate that we have truly come to Christ. Love is the same word as it used earlier in the text, agapao, agapao, to cherish, to have affection for, to take pleasure in. It is the sacrificial love of God that he demands of his people. Let's think illustratively of how the New Testament church really got this. In Ephesians chapter 5, Three times is the exhortation, the command for the husband to love his wife as what? Christ loved the church. Love your closest neighbor, your closest neighbor is your spouse. Love her as Christ loved the church. And there's only one right answer, husbands, if you're humble and truthful. No way. I can't. Left myself. So rather than be exalted in pride of what a great husband I am, such commands decimate how miserably I fail so that I might humbly beg God to show me, to teach me, and to help me through the inner working of His Spirit to love as He loves. Over in Romans 13, if you're going on this little cross-reference journey with me, Romans 13 Another connection. Jesus is not the only one in the New Testament that's going back to the primary commandment and connecting the secondary commandment with it. In Romans 13, verse 8, Paul gives us what's a simple command. Oh, nothing to anyone except love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's Leviticus 19, 18. Again, staring us in the face in the New Testament. 
know, he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Okay, oh, that's what Paul wrote to the Romans. What's he write to uh, other saints? How about the churches in the Galatian region? What, is he, what does he say to them in Galatians 5 and verse 13? He says that you were called to freedom, brethren, only don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Boy, some of the brothers and I in our Bible study are reading Strzok's book, Love, love or Die, Christ's Call to the Church. We need to learn through a lifetime how to grow in this love for God and love for neighbor. Thus the need for the Spirit. In the New Testament, this love is what's characteristic of God and the work that he's done in his people. So that one who doesn't find the source of love in God will fail to exhibit God's unique love to one's neighbor. So the, the difference is is the measure of love for neighbor. Love for God, it's first. Having experienced the love of God, it now makes it possible. We don't need some some step-by-step -step guide or formula because the Bible teaches that love is God-taught. So like in the back of our, the Bible study book that the guys and I use, and there's a list of a bunch of New Testament passages on love, and those will help us in our biblical education on love. But it's not the end of the road. When God's love has been shed abroad in your heart and we're not loving, there comes the convicting ministry of the Spirit, does it not? The early church learned it well. So we pattern love after him who exercised covenant love to Old Testament Israel, to the church. Romans 5.18, God demonstrated his love to us in the while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So he gave. Love's not a matter of getting, but a matter of giving. And it's not giving to get. Nor is love merely a feeling, though it may have feelings attached. It's one that makes a decision. What's marital love? It's a commitment. Forsaking all others and holding to your spouse for a lifetime. And it's not a matter of Shacking up in lust or as long as the good times roll. It acts. It gives another what they need. Do you see what Jesus attached here? When he says in verse 31 that the second is you shall love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Love for self is the instinctive desire to promote one's own good. You want a Reader's Digest uh, biblical anthropology study of man? Man is a lover of self. Every single one of us. It is assumed in Scripture as a reality. So one more warning this morning. Shepherding comment here. Hear me clearly. This is not a justification of self-love as been often espoused. You want to get sick to your stomach? Do a little Google search on self-love. And this is all about what the world has to offer us and in all the self-help books, the motivational speeches. When the Bible addresses self-love, it's just a recognition of the original principle of our nature, our fallenness. In all the Bible, there is no command to love yourself. Friends, we already love ourselves too much. The Bible just takes it for granted that human beings do love themselves and habitually act in their best interest. We naturally exhibit concern towards self, and Jesus commands us, you're taking extreme measures to love yourself. What about your neighbor? He's not saying castigate self. He's not saying hate self, even though there is, Jesus says, you want to be my disciple? Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Sometimes that cross is pretty heavy to bear. We want to love ourselves. We naturally exhibit concern. 
Our masters demand and we exercise a love equal to what we already have for ourselves towards our neighbor, the one near us. Now, if we were to go back to Leviticus where this first appeared, neighbor meant fellow Israelites. You come to the New Testament, it's given the widest possible extension of meaning. I'll give you one example. Jesus defines neighbor with a story of the Good Samaritan. And the people you think that would help him walk right on by. Matter of fact, I can't be too close to this unclean Samaritan. I'm going to go by on the other side. Jesus teaches in his story that your neighbor is anyone in need. Your closest neighbor is your spouse if you're married. If you've got family, they're your closest uh, neighbor. You come to church, we're your neighbors. Across the street in the restaurant. How about a little kindness in those lines at the store? Because what do they need? They need a little more Jesus than our fleshiness. It's especially difficult. Here we are sinners, loved by God, and called to love fellow sinners. The same way God loved sinners, not when they got their act all cleaned up. This is hard stuff. This is impossible without the work of the Spirit in our lives. Jesus says, you measure you've already been loving yourself, love your neighbor. He says, there's no commandment greater than these. Certainly there are other commands in Scripture, and Jesus is not saying they're not important. He's not saying to ignore the hundreds of prohibitions, nor the positive commands that he gives us in Scripture. There's a lot of them. But if we could take all the other commands of Scripture and just think through this love filter, am I loving God, am I loving my neighbor? A lot of our sins that we commit against God or against neighbors, because it's the love factor. We're not loving God or neighbor. I'm so glad to see a couple authors get this, get this right. Every sin against our neighbor, flows out of insipid love. How can we love our neighbor, horizontally, who's been created in the image of God when our love for God himself is so apathetic? When love does not motivate and undergird all our relationships, we'll find that instead of protecting and rejoicing with others, it's easier to, to gossip about them and, and judge and envy them. When we don't love others, we'll fear them too. We'll fear what they might say about us. Are they going to accept me or not? Fear will enslave us. We'll be tied to their opinions, their wants and demands. Without fervent love driving and informing all our relationships, we'll constantly swing back and forth between slavish, joyless servitude, motivated by guilt and self-love, and self-sufficiency and anger motivated by our pride and self-love. Love is the key to every sin problem in our lives, both vertically and between ourselves and the Lord and horizontally between ourselves and others. Friends, we need to get that. We need a double dose of that. For Jesus, the requirements of Shema cannot be fulfilled in the ceremonial rituals and sacrifice, but whole and genuine love for God. Don't offer your offering if it's not representing your Heart of worship, he said. And it must be complemented by love for neighbor. You know, loving God is the most loving thing we can do for our neighbor. Leaving them a model of God love. They need Jesus in those intense moments of fellowship, not our fleshiness. Many times our love for God is expressed in our love for neighbor. Why are we loving one another? Because he set his love upon you. That's why I'm loving you. We're saints that have been called to him, called together at the foot of the cross. Those whom he loves commands that we love. 1 John 4, 20. You know, believers nullify their profession of faith of love for God without corresponding love for neighbor. I, I referred to that in, in 1 John when I read that verse for us. Gives us that love test. Wish we had time for 
illustrations, you know, whether it be the church that threw out a pastor with no severance, no care for the family, because he interfered with their social club in their non-church, devoid of love. Well, we're studying some of the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. How about the church at Ephesus that lost its first love? Look at Ephesus. Jesus calls for repentance for leaving their first love. If we are not aggressively and proactively reaching out, all are fulfilled in these two commandments. For any of you that used to go to Sunday school or had family devotions, do you ever memorize the Ten Commandments? In all Ten Commandments, let's think about the love factor. The first commandment of supreme importance summarizes the first table of the Decalogue. Exodus 20, verses 2 to 11, man's duty to God. And the second, to love your neighbor as yourself, fulfills the second table, man's duty to his fellow man, verses 12 to 17. Matthew goes on to, to say, Jesus said on these two commandments, hang all the law and prophets. All the legal as well as prophetic scriptures find their zenith in love. This double love comprehends all righteousness. So it simplifies life, friends. The essence of the believer's duty is moral, not ceremonial. Think through this, the scenarios this past week and see if it is not true that any of our sin issues are due to a lack of love. Think of it this week as you reduce your expectations and increase the love factor to love God and love neighbor. Well, we've got to bring the plane down for the landing in the last point, a correcting Savior, verses 32 to 34. Not a lot, is, well, there's a lot to say, we just don't have time to say it. These verses, verses 32 to 34, are unique to Mark. We see in the scribe an open-minded inquirer. He says, right on, teacher. You've truly stated that he is one, and there's no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. He's ready to accept the truth even from Jesus. He was the most honest inquirer that day and received commendation from our Lord. He may have initially been sent with sinful motives from the Sanhedrin. And if he himself started off that way, he was convicted and changed in the process on the spot. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, verse 34, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. Right, teacher, you, you truly said. He gained, or he, he regarded Jesus as admirable. And he didn't hesitate to say so openly. You know, can you hear, we, we've seen the intense day in the temple, and you can kind of hear the gasps from among his fellow scribes and Pharisees. And you see the alarm written all their face because they came to decimate Jesus, unlike this man. And when Jesus saw he'd answered intelligently, intelligently pictures him as replying in a manner of one who possessed a mind of his own. He really understood what he said. This one had comprehended the significance of Jesus' reply. And among all those vicious opponents that day, he sees a heart still open to the gospel who might still qualify for entrance into the kingdom of God. It's remarkable. And you know, it's both a compliment as well as an appeal. He says, you've come a long way, scribe. He's near the kingdom, the reign of God, and the life of his people. Not far. But what does that indicate? He's not in the kingdom yet. He needs to go a little further in love and acceptance of the person of him who was the kingdom incarnate. The king 
is right near him. This, this whole uh, interchange is ironic. Scribe comes to pass judgment on Jesus. Jesus passes judgment on him. The scribe is the one equipped and authorized to pass judgment on the law. But Jesus possesses a higher authority, just another display of sovereign authority. Jesus pronounces the, the scribes not far from the kingdom. Yet he'd been speaking of Torah, not eternal life. And it might miss your, we're talking about Torah, what are you talking about eternal life? The scribe can judge whether a person is faithful to Torah, but Jesus affirms the essence of Torah and supersedes Torah's authority. He supersedes every creedal confession and formulation to draw near to the kingdom of God, not through a proper theology of the law, but by drawing near to Jesus. Kingdom's not present in Torah, but in Christ himself, the king. He needed simply to love and obey the one who could grant him access to that forever kingdom. You know, we're called to be great commandment believers, dear friends, constantly thinking and acting through this love grid. Am I pleasing and glorifying God by my love for him and expressing it this way? How about my neighbor? Am I pursuing more love for self than others? Beloved, we need more than rehabilitation. We need regeneration. Gospel is the heart of it all. Only once we're regenerated can we love God, and that means that self-love is put off. It also affects our love for another. Would you pray with me? Father, we understand we cannot be loving you and our community and still be loving ourselves. We understand that the day that we met the Master in saving faith, our love affair with self ended. So continue to teach us how to please our Lord and please our neighbor rather than self. That it's not just a matter of outward expression in behaviors and morality, but in the desires of our heart, the strings of our affection, a devoted heart. Lord, we understand if we get the heart right, everything else will come after. It's not complicated, so shepherd us in the process. For your glory and our good, we pray. Amen. Let's sing our song of response to God be the glory.